calling from an 818 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? It's Dave from Jamaica. Hey, crew. How are you guys doing? Dave, so good to hear from you. How are you doing? Oh, I'm not bad. So right into the topic. Um, I wanted to talk about crime because I know a few be- weeks back, you know, people are trotting out the old 90s arguments. Oh, yeah. How to deal with crime at home. And, you know, very frustrating from certain folks. But the the thing I want to say is, though, I am... I tend to, since I've dealt with these type of arguments for a long time, especially in Jamaica, which we had, um, we still have crime issues, but less so now because there's more economic development. So I wonder, I wonder why. But so um, the issue I have is, I think sometimes in this debate we need to be a little more. I don't know what the right word is, but tougher with people in the sense that. A lot of people kind of repeat certain narratives about crime and so on and so forth. And challenging them tends to cause them to think about it, even though they might be upset in the moment, right? Because when you have to think about the position you're defending, you know, that kind of can crack open an avenue to change one's mind. Or am I alone in that type of thinking? Not you're you're right, not alone, Dave, but... but... Too much hand- I don't know if you're at work. Your phone's a little bit cutting out. Um, oh, yeah, and definitely mine. at work. So I'm going to make it quick. Okay. Um, so the last thing I, I want to add to that is um, how do you think we should, um, how do you guys think the best way to approach it? Because, like, you know, sometimes reading out stats, people don't tend to listen. But, you know, I think it is a, it, you know, I think it's uh, these things are kind of self-evident, you know, like, you know, if you have a job, you're not going to, you're less likely to commit crime. And people, you know, shoplifting are not making bank. That, I know that was a ridiculous statement in this. <laughs> yeah. And I think a lot of people don't really understand how crime actually works. You know, there's no statistical number of people who are just, who just like, or kleptomaniacs. <laughs> so, I do find it frustrating because, you know, I hear the same stuff and I I have it out with people and granted they're upset in the moment, but they 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 have to, they, they kinda of have to come to terms with reality and you know. It's not just bad people, good people, you know. No, a materialist analysis. Anyway. Right. Since I'm I mean, at work, pro- I don't the, want the, echo the, to kill you guys. So later. All right, you're, cool. We'll you're respond, saying, David. Yeah. Yeah, basically, you know, the problem is like people, uh, 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 this isn't an, uh, like a conversation about like an abstract policy or something. Like this is something that people actually experience in their everyday lives directly. Not like, oh, this policy does that and that's effect- that affects this. This is a direct effect on people. Like if you're walking down the street and, you know, uh, something happens to you, you get attacked, you get mugged, whatever, you directly experience that. So if someone's telling you that, you know, um, you know, the city's been whatever city has been safer than ever. You're dealing with people who are like, well, I just had this happen to me. So how can you say that? Because that's basically how people experience these things uh, or how they view it through that lens. Like, you know, when we say the city's safe, it doesn't mean there is no crime. That just means statistically it's 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 you're less likely for something to happen it's less likely for something to happen to you it was worse unfortunately for for those people who it does happen to that they're they're they are that small percentage in that statistic but you know it's it's hard to convince them that because you know they directly experienced it Mm -hmm. but you know it's it, it's hard to like say like you said like people don't listen to like stats and stuff but this is something where like that is super important like no no one considers this until a crime happens to them like no one walks through their every day where crime doesn't happen to them and say oh everything's so safe crime isn't happening to me they ever only think about this when it does like the absence of crime is not something people think of they just that's just well, they, that's add- the default I'm, but it's it's sort you're you're right, Bender. But it's also people like get titillated by it. To be honest with you, that haven't experienced it before. So like it's driven a lot by specifically in New York, 
people that live in suburbia that are obsessed with property values that come into that that read the New York Post and women that listen to true crime or something like that. And they're almost just like, well, you know, God, it's so scary, all these black and brown people in New York and they'll read the New York Post or if people just keep their TV on. Every local news story is about some sort of crime, which completely misrepresents the trends, you know? So I think it's also right. like the prospect of it having to people, there's this, you know, I don't know. I, I, I It's hard for me. It's almost I, titillating is the only word I can think of, honestly. No, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. because that's how that's how you have to cover it. Like, you know, the, the, the local news isn't going to be like, uh, you know, uh, uh, let's say New York, 8 million people. Uh, uh, 7.9999 million people did not have crime happen to them today. Uh, you know, they don't do that. They go, oh, here are the 10 people that, uh, you know, these are the 10 news stories where 10 different people had uh, something happened happened to them today and they rinse wash repeat and people see that and they go oh it must be scary out there or something when like mm. it's just you know that's just ridiculous to think about it that way like people's perception on this is completely like out of whack the fact that you're able to go to work walk down the street go to a restaurant go pick up your kids from school whatever and something not happened to you 9.9 .9 times out of 10 is the fact that things are safe like their their crime yeah, is down. It's, it's also, I mean, I'm sorry. Were you going to jump in, Matt? No, no. I was, just say, oh. I was just going to say real quick. Prison populations, like you have to look at this stuff systemically. And, and the thing is, like, even into the individual lens of like this person says like points to like society needing to c control people more is just not going to satisfy even victims of crime. Ultimately, you need to look at how these things, like what leads to rising levels of desperation, that sort of thing. But also. You can't look at something like prison without looking at the fact that that means federal money for the um, to imprison people. That's an industry. And also that means, you know, uh, that comes to the census um, that the county that the prison population is in. So you take people out of certain communities and put them into like less uh, urban ones and count that towards like this is all systemic stuff. You just have to look at it that way. Yeah, I mean, just to, you know, echo what Matt and Emma was saying, I think you know, at local television level, you just see murder, 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 like kill, 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 uh, which I know probably sounds a good song, but it, it's, it's not. <laughs> it's just, it's, you know, it's just the eight o'clock news in New York City. At the, you know, more national news level, you might see statistics like Dave was hinting at about like falling crime, you know, overarching, like longitudinal studies about stuff. But I feel like even on, um, even on national news, you don't really see that contextualized. You know, you might see that crime has fallen since the 80s or since the 90s or since, you know, some arbitrary date and time. And they might gesture to like changing social social economic conditions in the country, but very rarely are they going to have someone who is just a criminologist or a sociologist come on and explain specifically what has caused the crime rate to fall because generally speaking, America has a very conservative view on crime and that crime is caused by intellectual and moral failings of criminals and not the material conditions that we subject large portions of this country to, which make them desperate, which give rise to criminality in various parts of the traditionally de deprived uh, communities. And so, you know, bringing people on to explain how crime actually works might be more compelling, but it doesn't fit that sort of larger narrative that crime is an individual, so individual uh, moral intellectual failure. So it, it's difficult to get people into thinking in that sort of more progressive frame of mind. Like Matt was saying that crime is a structural and social failure and we can it can only be dealt with that way because we just have a very individualistic society and people are, you know, oftentimes only hearing about like crime and what causes crime and criminals on the news from like cops. You'll have like a ex cop or like an ex DA come on to talk about like what he thinks is causing crime. And also to your point, Emma, like a lot of people's definition of crime is still like broken windows policing. And so they mm. see graffiti or they see a homeless person on the street or they see any other like long list of like urban trends like garbage and they immediately associate that with danger. And that was a concerted effort by the police and by uh, police uh, associated organizations to make it easier to over police communities. Yeah, Eric you know, Adams like, literally you know, that, that admitted last... that oh, in the no. interview with OIME. Uh, he's like, yeah, you know, sometimes people are concerned about it. It's like, bro, that's your job is to help people not see uh, the homeless problem as crime and actually something you need to address. 
You know, that's that is a I think that specifically the uh, issue of homelessness, I think that is a huge driver of this uh, this fear mongering over crime that we're seeing right now, mm -hmm. because without a doubt, uh, you know, crime is down. But also homelessness has gone up over the past few years. Mm. Uh, there is a distinct yeah. rise in homelessness. Now, being homeless is not a crime. And people who are homeless are no more likely to commit crime than anyone else. In fact, they are more often they're more likely to be the victim of violent crimes than be the ones to commit violent crimes. But people see homeless people, uh, you know, uh, people housed people see homeless people and they feel unsafe. So then they distinctly they, they, they correlate that immediately with crime. Um, and so that I really do think, and then that's why we probably see this, uh, you know, this, this, I'm seeing this everywhere. Mainstream media is going wild with this. I heard on like the radio, like one of the morning zoo shows the other day, the whole squatting issue, which yeah, has been a thing, thing forever squat. First of all, squatters, there is no squatters rights law in New York. There are, uh, tenant laws. And a lot of times these, uh, people who are squatting claim to have tenants rights and that's why they're protected. There's no like actual like um squatters rights in new yeah. york at least um there should be but uh um, to the extent they <laughs> exist anywhere it's because the alternative is brutality that people actually can't uh, fathom even in like bygone years like that's why squatters laws exist in like england or whatever it's because like the otherwise you, you just can't it, because we're so used to enforcing like bending society towards the capitalist needs now that we can't even fathom how these sorts of rights could have ever been enshrined for people that just need shelter. I mean, even the phrasing squatters versus tenants well, rights, but they're one right. and the same. It's just one is used to say, look at this delinquent over here. Well, I mean, you know, the, I, I, you know, I think I think, though, if someone if someone owns a dilapidated a property that's dilapidated and have had no upkeep to it and it's yes. harming the, the neighborhood or the greater good of the people who live in the surrounding area. And you, it's, it's like this for like a decade for some cases, like then, yeah, they, the city should take or the local municipality should take over and say, we are taking this property from you. You are delinquent on it. You don't care for it. We do that with other things. Like you, you should yeah. not be able to, uh, oh, like someone who wants to live there and, and actually care for it should be able to take it over after a certain period of time. Yeah, I mean, just to your point, Matt, I think that the, the squatter thing is just a concerted moral panic to make, uh, you know, the homeless uh, moral panic wasn't being inflamed enough. And so now the implication is that they're going to break into your home. Like you're going to go away on vacation and they're going to break into your home and they're going to squat in your home while you're out like in Turks and Caicos. And then when you come back, like, well, these squatter laws, they're not going to be able to get them out. They're going to have trash to place. And it's to make, you know, homeless people seem even more dangerous or to give this new edge to them that will make it easier for what I can only assume are like tenants association. I'm not tenants associations, uh, you know, uh, landlord, you know. Landlords, landlords essentially tenants landlords associations in places real like estate Florida, groups real yeah. estate groups to like kick you out of your home uh when you miss like one payment like because you're now suddenly a squatter so we have a relevant piece of sound here i saw hassan react to this because i think this guy's a hassan fan um purple pingers uh, jordan vanderberg in australia and we, we we're gonna go a little bit long here but this is a really great segment it first it introduces the sort of story here and then he debates these guys so we'll uh, watch this well, with Australia in the grips of a housing crisis, one determined housing advocate slash TikTok star has made it his mission to help put a roof over people's heads. Over the weekend, his mission got the attention of Americans, many of whom now say he needs to be dead. Just a public service announcement for uh, any rich people who live in a rich suburb and uh, land banking an empty house. Just remember to change the lock. This is housing advocate Purple Pingers, a.k.a. Jordan Vandenberg. And he's got a message for the owners of some of Australia's roughly 136,000 empty homes. Homes are for people to live in, not for rich people to make money off. Late last week, Mr Pingers let the internet know he was collecting the addresses of vacant properties through his website. There's a link which will let you submit just a vacant house. house. And over the weekend, he published a handful of said uh, addresses. Well, I want to say this guy was asked before deleting. This guy, this guy kicks ass. This guy's yeah. awesome. Um, for Jordan. 
actually skip ahead to the interview, Bradley. Um, we'll get right into it. But I mean, just the, the the point here is like these are houses that are just left vacant. They're not. Um, uh, any, nobody's allowed to move in because the people who own it aren't allowed to get enough of a return from the people who would be tenants of it. Um, so they just are left there. And he points out like if I I have zero interest and in particularly using my platform to say like oh the people that are holding these houses vacant um, we should have we should be against we should be supporting them. No, absolutely not. Go ahead, Bradley. Skip, skip to the um, yeah I mean and and to what Brandon was saying earlier as well uh, so much of this media uh, th uh, basically pro landlord propaganda is pushed by like, these real estate groups and and tra and, and these uh, landlord associations in the same way that the uh, organized retail theft uh, f uh, headlines right. were pushed by real estate or er, by um, by what do you retail call it? retail retail organizations and the National Retail Federation, I believe it's called, and then you find out that oh, those numbers were completely fugazi and they made them up to sh to cover up the fact that they op re opened like a Target store in an area that didn't have enough business, and so then they blamed it on shoplifting. Um, and these well, yeah, just, and, I, 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 yeah. Just, I do I do want to say like it's. It, What's what's yeah. really amazed me about this whole discourse <laughs> about the, the the squatters and 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 everything is that, like, I've seen like if you're a tenant, which a large portion of this country is, if you're a tenant, why the fuck do you care about this? Like, why do I see people who are renters yeah. or tenants out there, or even someone who owns a single fucking home and that's their residence where they live? Why do you care about this? It does not affect you. It will never affect you. Bender, it's you a four-letter word: C U C K. You, you are literally hurting uh, laws that are established to actually protect you, the renter or tenant. Like, it is absolutely ridiculous. Like, I saw, I saw someone in the chat say, like, yeah, uh, you won't the live chat on YouTube. Yeah, like, but if you owned a property and this happened to you, you'd think differently. Well, guess what? Yeah, that's I will never own a second property and this will never right. happen. To, I'll never, mm -hmm. first of all, I don't even know if I ever own a single property, but I'll never for sure own a second property. This will never happen to me. Exactly. So why the hell would I care yeah. that someone who's unhappy Housed, finds an empty, uncared for home and is living in it temporarily. You know, if the, per, yeah. the homeowner comes and wants to take it back, they have to go through the legal process. Oh, no. But guess what? They'll most likely get it back. Like this is absolutely ridiculous for anyone who's a, a, a working class or, or a middle class who even owns a single home and no more to care about this. It is absolutely. And they, I think I think the stat is in this country, I think like one or two million out of what, 360 million or whatever live in this country own more than one home. Like, give me a break that this is a major issue that people are caring about in this country. This is literally the issue, like uh, you're fighting for the upper, upper class who would never fight for you. This is the same thing about like, oh, caring about uh, uh, the tax rate on people, on the multimillionaires, because what if I, uh, someone who makes less than six, six figures, one day becomes a multimillionaire? Give me a break. It's this is just the same ridiculous. resentment though when, when student loans get forgiven. I had to pay my dues and you don't have to pay your dues. Uh, you should have to pay your dues too and go yeah. through this it's just like the literal de you know it's what the ruling class always says it divides people along these lines and then pretends as if it's some sort of big problem this is addressed um in this the, uh, um interview here that i want to get to but uh butthole says in the chat who has a number 45 on their uh, icon love seeing broke people that can't afford a house in the first place pretend that squadron isn't a real issue no it's a real issue for people like you for us it's fine <laughs> Well, joining us now is Purple Pingers himself. It's Jordan. G'day, Jordan. Look, I know we're in a, a pretty serious housing crisis, but do you really think that encouraging people to squat on private property is the way to fix it? Yeah, look, let me answer your question by asking you another question. Um, do you think it's right that we have thousands of vacant, abandoned homes while we have people living on the street? No, I don't. I don't. Oh, but is this, is this the right way to handle it, though? I mean, shouldn't we focus it on policy? Um, yeah, I think there's definitely room to focus on policy. But what do we do in the meantime when people are on the street while we're focusing on policy? Use the word abandoned. Who owns a house and abandons it? 
Jordan? Uh, many people. I don't know if you've ever gone down the street and seen like houses empty for decades, but uh, I certainly no, have. No, I haven't. No. Oh, really? Interesting. No. How many? Do, do you have any abandoned investment properties, Steve? No, I don't. But, I mean, I'm, I'm just trying to get to the economics of this. If someone yeah. buys a property, I mean, yes, we've had land banking, obviously, mm -hmm. from foreigners, mm -hmm. but that's not widespread. There's not thousands of them. Uh, on the census night, we had 10% of all housing stock um, vacant. But like, you know, I asked people for less than 48 hours and I've already got over 300 responses. Um, so, and that like, I'm not the government, so I don't have the resources to ask everyone. But yeah, if you've got like over 300 places that have been abandoned for more than two years, some up to 20 years, uh, I think it's a problem that exists. Thank you for clarifying. You are not indeed the government. Jordan, indeed. Right. Thank you. Okay. Um, so you put this up. Are, are people actually moving into these homes? Um, yes. Not from the public ones, though. So not from the ones you've listed? Yeah. So it's happening, what, privately? Word of mouth or something? Yeah, yeah. Like if someone, if someone needs a house, they can reach out to me and I can send them an empty home. What sort of people are moving into these homes? You're seeing families with kids and... Um, it's mainly people just experiencing housing insecurity and that can, yeah, that can look like anyone. Do they hook the house up to electricity, power, gas? Haven't asked them. <laughs> so, so, they're, so they're just basically camping out in abandoned homes with no power? Yeah, I guess it, like it's raining in Melbourne at the moment, so um, I guess camping out inside is probably better than camping out in a bush. What about the idea that you might be encouraging people to, you know, break the locks and, and move into a property? I mean, you say you don't do that, but if someone finds out from you, Jordan, that this house in this street's vacant, has been for two years, and it is locked, how do you know they're not going to go around there and bust the lock and get in? I'm definitely not advocating that anyone well, I know you're not advocating it, but how do you house. know it's not going to happen? Well, like, squatting's legal, breaking and entering is not legal, and I think that's where I'd leave it. You also say good people disobey bad laws. Mm, certainly, <laughs> yeah. So is that one of those bad laws you would want them to disobey? No comment while eat. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can, you can say no comment, but it's kind of the heart of the matter, isn't it? Uh, absolutely. Like, I, th I think this is, a, like, this is a pretty big ethical question that we need to ask ourselves. Um, and we've got, you know, the government promising a couple houses in a decade or two from now while we have people living on the street and empty homes. And I think... Like, you know, we've got adverse possession laws in Australia and we've got, um, you know, squatting is legal in Australia. So what's the solution? I think it's staring at us. Well, how'd you like to have someone squat in your place that you own? Uh, it's not vacant, nor is it an investment property. So You understand um, my question, don't you? Uh, yeah, it's a stupid yeah, one. Yeah, it's a bad yeah, one. It's right. a but, but that was my if so, point. If someone's living somewhere and they break and enter and go inside, that is not squatting. That's something completely different. Like, it's yeah. a stupid question. Yeah, no, this is like, but that's what I, I, I intended by they're trying to convince everybody that if you leave your house for even 10 minutes, that like people are going to move in. And it's right. like, maybe if you live in the West Bank and they're Israeli settlers, they will. But like, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, in countries that respect laws around uh, housing, that probably won't happen. But in these cases, like, yeah, they're trying to convince it could happen to anybody when this is just a problem for landlords with who are leaving properties vacant because they can't rented at the levels that they want to rent it at people who bought houses during the record low inflation and they want to flip them but the price for housing is is like it's a seller's i mean it's a buyer's market now so they're waiting and sitting on these houses for years because they've been over renovated or they exist in places like suburbs of phoenix where no one wants to live because it's 130 degrees outside and yeah like this country has an ex has a what I'm looking for uh, has a uh, oversupply of houses that are empty at this point. Yeah, and I mean all the, those speculative properties. Yes, they're second per properties often uh, purchased by capitalists. But what we're seeing in this country in particular is uh, these massive financial firms that are gobbling up housing in different areas and then reselling them for profit as well and sitting on them as they accumulate in value, yeah. um, which is should be illegal. But uh, just to give you a sense of how tilted the laws are in favor of landowners versus tenants. Go ahead, Brandon. 
I was going to say, but you know, if you look at like real realtor TikTok or like landlord TikTok or like HGTV shows, you can imagine that it's just like a cute young like couple in their 20s who are like mm-hmm. buying a cheap house in a neighborhood and they're flipping it and they're going to like make use that money to pay for their kids college. And this is so they can have financial freedom. But that's just not the actual story of like vacant homes in America. That like that the actual story is like you said, like private uh investment firms buying them up and leaving them empty. Yeah. And I'm sorry, like the solution to you needing to pay for your kids college isn't to uh, have vacant hold properties vacant until you find somebody that can pay it uh, to where it's profitable for you. Like yeah. people who are in here saying like, you know, you don't know what it's like to have I do not care. Yeah. That is not my problem. That's not a problem. I, I, think. Buy three houses. Even, I think we should take that problem off you by after that property being vacant for a certain amount of time, that is uh, public property. Like that's, that's where I'm at. So I think people, we need to be clear about this, about how much you get nothing. If you hold property is vacant, I do not care. You are not, this is not our problem. This is not the problem of working people in general. That's a specific problem to you. You made a bad investment. Exactly. Um, all right, guys. No more time for calls. I'm sorry. Uh, we're just going to read some IMs and get out of here. Dave from Jamaica. Lots of these capitalist fans would be very sad to hear Adam Smith's view on rent seeking and passive income. The, yeah, the un, the unacknowledgedly based sometimes Adam Smith. Squat, please, says Matt is so on point, but I am a tenant and have been for six years two months back i bought my first and only property but will move in only after retirement as it is my hometown where i can't work from should i be concerned or due to a rise in squatting is it vacant well well, there's not really a rise in squatting it's no more or less than i mean unless someone i don't think there's been any stats on this again a great a great point made out in that um in that clip that we aired is that uh (laughs) They have they have no idea that people are squatting because oh, like how many people are squatting because unless the the owner of the home actually ends up going over there they never find out and and right. rent exactly. it, if you if you have a property then I don't understand rent, rent it, it out rent it out for somebody and you can also make money off of that right. which is good for you and good for the person like and, the idea that you should just be able to put a lock on it for five years when you're ready for it like no maybe you should sell it in the meantime or something else like like you can't keeping properties vacant is just not acceptable yeah like and rent it out to somebody even if it's for cheaper than you want it to I don't I don't know like that that's it's a problem but like th- again this is this sort of thing also your problem is a very specific problem that right. again we're, 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 we can't piecemeal policy to deal with like something that protects like the smallest percentage of people the 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 group of people who bought a house five years before they're going to retire but they need to stay where they're renting currently i mean it just i understand this is a problem for you but it's just not a broad issue facing for society the vast majority of people yeah um you could hire a caretaker to check on the property uh, once every uh, every couple of weeks. I believe a squatter needs to stay in there for 30 days to have rights in terms of being able to be considered a, a, a quote unquote tenant, I believe. So you just need someone to go in and make sure everything's uh, looking good. If you care for the property, too, no one's going to think it's. Um, it's, uh, you know, it, but it's you should abandoned. probably visit it every once in a while. People are just concerned. Right, yeah. like, like these aren't like, these yeah. aren't real concerns. Like buying a house 10 years before you move into it and no one occupies it forever. You know, this sort of like intermittently occupied vacation home that you only visit every three years. Like this isn't happening. You know, yeah. uh, Americans can barely afford one house. That's why we're in this problem. So then the three people who can afford seven and want to like go through flipping them, like the, no. Yeah. Uh, Busy Drink says, are landlords keeping properties vacant because they can't get the desired rent? Wouldn't it at least mitigate the cost of owning it? Honest question. It's the fair question. Um, the, the landlords, you know, are, I think, less of the problem in this particular instance. Like the housing that he's referring to are speculative homes, properties yeah. that people are holding on to until they can get the right price. And it keeps going up and up in value because of housing insecurity. Probably a lot owned by the banks, frankly. Yeah. Yeah. And um, if but 
and if it would mitigate mitigate the cost of, of uh, owning it, yes, but they probably don't have a desire to rent it out. They're using it purely as speculation. And let's just address when they talk about, well, isn't policy better? Um, do, my, do my Australian <laughs> accent. Like, policy would be better, but the people no. who uh, run politicians are these same landlords. They own politicians and they don't want them buying so much housing that all of a sudden there's extra demand and it's cutting into the value that they are able to extract uh, from people um, from when there's not a whole lot of supply. Uh, or sorry, there's more supply. And so all of a sudden the demand is, is being met by publicly um, built housing that's their worst nightmare mm-hmm. so it's a conspiracy well that's why we haven't built uh, and a federal for or federal housing federally funded affordable housing has not been built since the 90s um, because yeah, despite Howard Schultz uh, coming up in it yep um, I will say what the uh, what the IM or said though uh, in terms of uh, uh, re- uh, retail property in New York City that is exactly what goes on. That's why there's so much empty space in Manhattan in terms of like uh, uh, you know places for people to go, um, restaurants, things like that. Because uh, these real estate companies try to get an entire building uh, that they own to be vacated by all like the many stores or companies that are in it, and then once it's completely empty, they wait it out. Out until some big, you know, chain or corporate brand comes in to rent out the whole thing because they know they get a shit ton more from that company. That's why you see so many banks yeah. in Manhattan because yeah. they're able to afford prices that you know restaurants and other places that people actually want to go to um, can't afford to uh, uh, rent for. Um, Haymarket said landlords who use unused homes can write off the loss on their buildings of the taxes uh, on their taxes. So owning unused housing is still a positive for a company with lots of buildings. Great point. That's the thing is like, that's why we say like, this is not our problem. You're already sorted out by politicians. They are looking after you like crazy right now. It's everybody who wants to affordably pay and not pay a quarter of half of their paycheck to frankly, a, a group of people that don't do a whole lot. Um, uh, yeah. You know. your, your left testicle says, how concerned should I be about all the white people living on my family's ancestral land? Can I do something about that? I'd love some anti-squatting laws to deal with my very specific problem. Um, <laughs> These damn squatters. I know. <laughs> Who is you says, fundamentally, I'm beginning to believe that we need a market crash in housing for all these things to be corrected because our governments won't do it. Every house around me is easily overvalued by $100,000. Well, you know, the Biden administration could start or the Fed could start by freaking lowering some of these interest rates, by the way, which have been uh it's been you know well past due for uh the fed to do such a thing but they need price controls with that too because that means cheaper money for people to speculate houses with yeah so like you you need uh you, we really need to be a bit more aggressively you know, regulating housing in this country yeah, i mean and I, I, I will say you know like even like rent though like i i remember not that long ago like when i was renting i started renting like uh over a decade ago um affordable housing in new york city was considered to be like in the you know upper three figures uh low four figures like you know uh you would apply to the housing lottery and if you for affordable housing and the prices start at like a thousand dollars a thousand two hundred dollars for like a one bedroom or something like that which is doable now if you look at those lotteries and what the starting affordable housing prices are they're in like the the two thousands that's the starting point for affordable yep. housing for a single individual it but is that's insane. in part that's because of the doable. but that's in part because the federal government hasn't funded it in 25 years or, or in 20 years or whatever like that's because of the fair cloth amendment which when aoc joined congress in 2018 she and bernie jo- uh or maybe it was 2020 i forget which when she did it but they were trying to revive uh, to re- to revive efforts to repeal it and that would be a huge place to start because that's in that's a federal moratorium on federal money going to f- affordable housing and that's a huge driver um and the the whole speculative industry is out of control anyway um jr and philly said you one of my favorite 30 rock lines is when dennis duffy says you can't kick me out i love you and i have squatters rights liz says which is it do you love me or do you have squatters rights and he (laughs) says i don't see why they're mutually exclusive (laughs) that's the guy uh he's one of the best characters um the beeper king dennis duffy yeah one of her uh yeah her her yeah the guy from the insurance commercials yeah the guy from all the all state mayhem in yeah. the all state commercials yeah, yeah her ex-boyfriend who's always returning 